Good evening. Turn on all the equipment up here so I can actually see what I'm doing this evening. On our way here tonight, I told Ivana to wake me up if I fall asleep. She said, aren't you preaching? I said, exactly. It's been a long day. I know a lot of y'all went to group meetings today. It's kind of been a long weekend for some reason or another. I'm just kind of washed out. But I'm glad that we're here together this evening so that we can worship God. And tonight we're going to be doing something that I kind of indicated a couple of weeks ago that we would do. We have every, every month here at North Beach, we have a QA. and a Two weeks ago when we had that Q&A, I indicated then that there were a couple of other questions that came in with the two that we addressed. And I would probably address those a little bit sooner than the next month. And so that's what we're going to do this evening. So I am calling this... The Q&A for September 2024, special edition, as we finish up these questions, because I really got four questions that all came out of the same passage of Scripture, and I want to address all of these while they are reasonably, reasonably fresh in our mind. I realized two weeks ago was like an eternity for a lot of us, but I hope that you'll remember what we covered two weeks ago. So if you will take your Bibles and go with me to Acts chapter 7, if you will find Acts chapter 7 in your Bibles and maybe put a bookmark there, if you're using a paper Bible, if you're using an electronic Bible, uh, just put an electronic bookmark there, because we're going to go back and forth and reference this passage as well as several others. When I got those first two questions, again, I actually had four that all came from this text. So I want to finish those four by looking at the last two of those this evening. So let's just go ahead and jump right in and get to the first of those questions for tonight, which is actually question number three. And that question is this. Stephen says, they, presumably Jacob and Joseph, were taken up from Egypt and buried in Shechem. Joseph was indeed buried in Shechem, but Jacob was buried in the cave of Machpelah. References there are given to Joshua chapter 24 and verse 32, also Genesis chapter 50 and verse 13. So what I'd like for us to do is I'd like for us to read all of these passages together. Acts chapter 7 verse 16, then we're going to go to Joshua chapter 24 and verse 32, then we're going to go to Genesis chapter 50 and verse 13 and see if we can kind of synthesize these facts that we're given and come to an understanding of what Stephen is doing here. So Acts chapter 7 and verse 16, and they were carried, I need to go back and read verse 15, the thought, and Jacob went down into Egypt and he died, he and our fathers, and they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of silver from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. So hold that thought in your mind and let's go over to Joshua chapter 24 and verse 32, Joshua chapter 24 and verse 32. We have the reference of the bones of Joseph being carried out of Egypt. As for the bones of Joseph, which the people, well, actually of them being deposited in Shechem, say that more accurately. As for the bones of Joseph, which the people of Israel brought up from Egypt, they buried them at Shechem in the piece of land that Jacob bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of money. It became an inheritance of the descendants of Joseph. Now let's go to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 50 and verse 13. Genesis chapter 50 and verse 13, this is speaking then about Jacob. Um, let's again pick up the reading in verse 12. Thus his sons did for him as he had commanded them, for his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field at Machpelah to the east of Mamre, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. So those are the references that are relevant to this particular question. We're going to look at that in just a moment. But one thing I want to do before we get into answering that question directly is I want to go back and repeat something that I said two weeks ago because I think this is important. We spent a little bit of time two weeks ago talking about Stephen and talking about this speech. I'm going to repeat that. This is word for word the same slide that I used two weeks ago. There is every indication in my mind at any rate that Stephen's speech here in Acts chapter 7 is inspired. We see that from looking at these verses that we are not going to look at tonight because we looked at them two weeks ago. Acts chapter 6 and verse 3, Acts chapter 6 and verse 5, Acts chapter 8, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 6 and verse 8, verse 10 of the same chapter, Acts chapter 7 and verse 55. What I would suggest, if you have some questions about that, 
Go back and look at the sermon that I preached two weeks ago. It's on YouTube. It's on Vimeo. Um, I don't know whether it's on Facebook or not, but it is definitely on YouTube and Vimeo. So you can go back and look at that and see what we said about that. But the long and short of the point made there is I believe as we're reading what Stephen is saying in Acts chapter 7, that he is inspired by the Holy Spirit. I think that's pretty important uh, because it will affect what we understand about these questions. Um, If Stephen is not inspired, and Luke, the inspired writer, is only recording the speech, then really we don't have to spend any time looking at these questions at all because we can just conclude that Stephen messed up all across the board because he wasn't inspired. I think he was inspired, and because he was inspired, it's important for us to figure out what Stephen is doing here in Acts chapter 7. So again, the last point on that slide is that without any apparent contradiction or difficulty, it is our response with any apparent, not without... I think I said that wrong last time too. With any apparent contradiction or difficulty, it is our responsibility to actually prove that such a difficulty exists. Okay, so anytime someone comes along and says, well, there's a contradiction between this verse and that verse, if we're looking at that, the burden on, a burden of proof is on us to prove that there is something there. And so we're looking at these questions, and I think it's important for us to understand First, Stephen was inspired. Second, we are dealing with some things that at first glance look to be contradictory. So it is on us to figure out whether there is a solution to the difficulty. So let's go back, and I guess I should have pulled that up before we went to the question itself. Let's go back and look at that question a little bit and see what we can figure out there. So if you'll take your Bibles and go back to Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 7, specifically verse, again, it's 15 and 16, okay? Acts chapter 7, verse uh, 15 and 16, and Jacob went down into Egypt and he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of money, for a sum of silver from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. I'm going to suggest to you that in looking at this question, what we need to understand in understanding this question is that the they there in our English translations, that is in verse 16, the they there refers to Joseph and the other sons of Jacob, but not Jacob himself. The English text, and I suspect that the Greek text is well underlying it, is somewhat ambiguous as to who that pronoun should be attached to. You have Jacob, goes down into Egypt, he dies, he and our fathers. Those fathers there are the patriarchs. It's Joseph and his brothers. They died, and they were carried back to Shechem. We know Joseph is carried back to Shechem. So who's the they there? I'm going to suggest to you that they there is a reference to Joseph and the other sons of Jacob, but not Jacob himself because Jacob is specifically said to have been buried at Machpelah. So that's the first thing I think we need to understand. Not only are Joseph's bones removed from Egypt, but his brothers are as well. Now I will tell you that there is no other reference to this in scripture except here. But what we need to remember is that there are times when the New Testament sheds light on things that we read or don't read in the Old Testament. And that that New Testament light that is shed is inspired, is God-inspired revelation. So we have the New Testament sometimes fills in some of the blanks that we have from the Old Testament. Or it gives us new information. That shouldn't be a problem for us. If we understand and believe that the New Testament writers are also inspired. The same Holy Spirit that inspired the writers of the Old Testament is inspiring the writers of the New Testament as well. If that is the case, then what we've got here is we've got Stephen giving us some new information. Not only about Joseph, we read about Joseph's bones in the Old Testament, not his brother's. If my understanding of this is correct, then what we have is Stephen telling us it wasn't just Joseph's bones that were taken out, it's the other patriarchs as well. Interestingly enough, there was a then current, and I mean in the first century, there was a first century tradition among Jews that Joseph's brother's bones were interred in Hebron at Machpelah. Stephen directly contradicts this claim. So what you've got is some Jewish folks in the first century that are saying not only are Abraham and Sarah and others buried there in Machpelah, in fact, Joseph's 
brothers are buried there as well. Joseph is down at Shechem, but the brothers are there. That was something that was going on among Jews in the first century. Stephen, if my understanding is correct, is saying that that tradition is incorrect. And that is that Joseph's bones, as well as his brothers, are at Shechem. Now let me say this. Something else that's going on here behind the text. And we have to understand this in the context of Stephen's speech. One thing that really would have irritated the Jewish hearers is to hear that Joseph and the other patriarchs are buried in Shechem. Anybody have an idea why that would be? Because Shechem in the New Testament period was Samaritan territory. Hebron was Jewish territory. So this tradition of all the patriarchs being at Hebron, being buried at Hebron, that would go very well. But this idea that these patriarchs are buried in Shechem, nah, boy, that's kind of, mm, don't like that idea a whole lot. What's interesting as well is, who is the author of Acts? Luke. Who also writes the Gospel of Luke. And one thing you may notice in looking at the Gospel of Luke is that Samaritans in the Gospel of Luke are portrayed in a very positive way light. And so that may be a part of what the Holy Spirit is doing here through Stephen's words. Maybe not. But in any case, I do believe that, uh, I do believe that Stephen is giving us some information that the Old Testament does not. Albert Barnes in his commentary wrote this. He said, no mention is made in the Old Testament of their carrying the bones of any of the other patriarchs. But the thing is highly probable in itself. If the descendants of Joseph carried his bones, it would naturally occur to them to take also the bones of each of the patriarchs and give them an honorable sepulcher together in the land of promise. And I think that makes sense because you've got the people that are leaving Egypt. Joseph has already said, you make sure you take my bones out. And I can imagine the Jewish people as they're getting ready to do this, they carry Joseph's bones. Well, what about the people who are descended from the other patriarchs? I think, given especially what Stephen tells us, is that those bones were removed as well and deposited at Shechem. So that's the first question this evening. Believe it or not, that's the easier of the two. Okay, so if right now your head is hurting, I hope you went to Starbucks on the way here because you may need it. Because your head's going to hurt even more after the second question because this one is the more complicated of the two. And it's actually the most complicated of the four that I received. So here's the second question concerning Acts chapter 7 and verse 16. Stephen says that Abraham bought a burial plot in Shechem from the sons of Hamor. He appears to be mixing up the cave Abraham bought near Hebron from the sons of Heth. Genesis chapter 23. With the plot Jacob bought in Shechem from the sons of Hamor, Genesis chapter 33, verse 19. All right, let's go ahead and read Genesis chapter 33 and verse 19. And I am going to, I'm going to try to slow down a little bit from what I normally do. I'm not going to try to talk quite as fast as I go through this question. Because not only is the question complicated, the answer is as well. Genesis chapter 33, let's look at verses 18 and 19. And Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, on his way from Padan Aram. And he camped before the city. And from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, he bought for a hundred pieces of money the piece of land on which he had pitched his tent. There he erected an altar and called it El Elohe Israel. So that's Genesis chapter 33 and verse 19. We see the details there. Jacob ends up in Shechem. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. He buys a piece of land where he has pitched his tent. Okay. At this point in time in the story, all that Jacob has done is bought the land where he's got his tent pitched. Notice it is Stephen in Acts chapter 7 that will fill in the blanks about people being buried there. And of course later in the text as well here in the Old Testament. But here in the original in Genesis chapter 33, not the original, what I mean by that is at the origin of the story. Genesis chapter 33 and verse 19, Jacob is merely purchasing a piece of land where he has pitched his tent, where he is living. All right, so looking at these questions, is there a mix up here? Has Stephen made a mistake? 
Has he indicated that it is Abraham that does this, not Jacob? When the Old Testament text clearly says that Abraham bought a plot of land at Machpelah in Hebron, whereas Jacob bought a plot of land at Shechem. All right, so in looking at this, in looking at this, the first thing that I need to indicate, I need to say, is that this is not a newly discovered issue. Okay? Um, You know the saying, there is nothing new under the sun? There is generally nothing new under the sun. People who have been studying the New Testament for a long time have come across this problem here in Acts chapter 7, have scratched their heads and wondered about it, and have come up with various ideas as to how to understand what's going on here. So it is not a newly discovered issue. This is not something that we came up with in 2024. This has been around for a very long time. And several explanations have been given for this problem. Notice I don't say contradiction, I say problem, okay? Several explanations have been given. One of those, one of those is that Stephen was simply wrong. He just said it wrong, okay? Maybe he made a mistake. Maybe he had a slip of the tongue. And so when he says that, he didn't really mean to say Abraham. He meant to say Jacob. If you have been listening to me preach for a long time, you know I never make a slip of the tongue, right? I never call out the verse when I mean the chapter. And I never call out the chapter when I mean the verse. And I never get the reference wrong, right? And I never misspeak misspeak about who did something at some point in time in the Bible. If you've been around the beach long enough and you've been listening to me regularly, you know that occasionally I make a slip of the tongue. As a matter of fact, I would would suspect that I probably make a slip of the tongue at least once every sermon that I preach. Some of you are very sharp-eared about that and will catch me before I even leave the auditorium and let me know, didn't you mean this? Well, yeah, I guess I meant that. You know, I don't have a slip of the tongue. Here's the difference. The Holy Spirit is not inspiring me. I stand before you as an uninspired man, which means I will make mistakes. I will make slips of the tongue. I try not to do it very often. But the explanation that's given is that Stephen was simply wrong. He made a mistake. He made a slip of the tongue. The problem I have with that is, is Stephen, if Stephen is inspired by the Holy Spirit, here's a question for you. Could Stephen make a slip of the tongue? I don't think so. Because a slip of the tongue is an error. And so if Stephen is inspired, he couldn't make an error in his speech. It had to be correct. Otherwise, we would have the Holy Spirit having inspired speech that is mistaken. When we go down that path, brothers and sisters, we've opened the door to be just about rejecting anything we don't like in Scripture, haven't we? So if Stephen is inspired, I'm going to have to reject that first idea. The second idea that is sometimes out there is that an early copyist or scribe accidentally wrote Abraham instead of Jacob. Now that is not a far-fetched idea because we do have in our New Testaments times where there are different readings. You follow along with me in an ESV, maybe you're following along in a New King James. And sooner or later... My translation is going to read considerably different than yours. There's going to be even perhaps a verse that is missing in the ESV. Actually, I would say it maybe has been added to yours, but at any rate, that's splitting hairs. So we do know that that happens. We've got very good evidence that that happens. If you're in my evidences class, we're going to spend some time talking about that because it does happen. The problem I have with that as an explanation for this particular question is that there is no evidence of it. When we look at differences in manuscripts, the reason we know there are differences in manuscripts is because we have different manuscripts. This is a hypothetical explanation without evidence. There isn't a single manuscript out there at all that I'm aware of that says Abraham instead of Jacob in Acts chapter 7 and verse 16. And so without that evidence, I feel pretty confident rejecting that as an explanation. Now let me say this, if that were true, it would mean that it happened very early. We're talking like the first person that ever copied the book of Acts. Because otherwise there would be some other manuscripts out there and manuscripts that were copies of manuscripts that didn't contain the error. And the problem is we don't have any of that. Okay, so I'm going to reject that as an explanation. Another explanation that's given is that Stephen is, quote unquote, telescoping his speech 
for the sake of time. What that means is that Stephen is compressing some facts and accounts, specifically Abraham buying the cave at Machpelah, Jacob buying the plot of land at Shechem. So he's compressing those facts and accounts. And this explanation alleges that this was not unusual among Jews at the time. Okay, that Jews sometimes did this as they're putting facts together, as they're putting stories together. And I will tell you, we don't do that in 2024 America. Okay, um, and if I did that at the University of Dallas when I was writing a paper, my professor would have bled all over that paper. Actually, he probably would have just ripped it up, handed it back to me, and said, "Try again." However. 2024 American standards are not necessarily the standards of the ancient world. We know that ancient writers are much freer in their quotations. We talked about this two weeks ago. So they will quote someone, but they will quote them very freely. We don't do that today, but in the ancient world they did. So it's possible that that is what Stephen is doing. He is simply combining accounts for the sake of time to move forward. What's interesting is is that had Stephen not been stoned to death at the end of all of this, and had he made errors in his speech, the Jewish council would have questioned him on that. And he would have had a time to explain that if, in fact, they thought there was some kind of an error. But, of course, we remember that that doesn't happen because, in the end, Stephen was taken out stoned to death. Okay? And I will tell you this idea of telescoping speech is a possible solution to the problem. And maybe, in fact, it is the solution to the problem. I have, my own, I have my own misgivings about that a little bit because I don't see many examples of that elsewhere. But it is certainly put out there as a possible explanation. So that leaves us with a fourth explanation that I'm going to share with you this evening. And this is the explanation that I personally, at the present, there's my caveat, right? lean towards. So let's look at this. As we look at this, first of all, we need to know a little bit about Abraham at Shechem. Not Jacob at Shechem, Abraham at Shechem. Because when Abraham comes to the promised land, he moves around a lot and he spends some time at Shechem. In fact, at Shechem, he does something very interesting and very important. He builds an altar. Abraham comes to Shechem and he builds an altar. There is, however, no reference at all to buying the plot of ground where the altar is built. So Abraham comes to Shechem and he builds an altar. Then, then Abraham ends up at Bethel slash Ai. The location is between those two places. And also at Hebron. And what does he do in those two places? He builds an altar. So we could put this up on a map, and we will, with some references that I'll let you read later at home, if you can read those. Boy, those are really small. Okay? So Abraham builds an altar up here at Shechem. Genesis chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. He builds an altar as well between Ai and Bethel. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 8. You don't have to go very far to get those. They're right there in the same chapter. And then we find in Genesis chapter 13 that Abraham builds yet another altar at Hebron. So that's chapter 13 and verse 18. Abraham actually builds a fourth altar that's not on this chart. That is the altar there in the mountains of Moriah in the vicinity of Jerusalem. That would be this area right there. That's the altar where he's going to sacrifice, where he's going to sacrifice uh, Isaac, his son, okay, on the commandment of God. So he actually builds four, but these are the three I want us to look at. So he comes to Shechem, builds an altar. He comes to Bethel, Ai, builds an altar. He goes to Hebron, he builds an altar. Later, we read in the text that he buys a plot of land, including a cave, at Hebron as a burial spot. Okay? Um, so remember that, those three places. So he's at Shechem, he builds an altar. Then he gets to Hebron. At Hebron, a whole lot of things happen. So at Hebron, in Genesis chapter 14, we find out about Lot getting kidnapped, basically. And what does Abraham do? He goes and frees Lot. It's also at Hebron where Abraham encounters Melchizedek. Genesis chapters 15, 16, and 17 are probably set here as well. It is not specifically stated, but I think the indications are pretty good that they are at Hebron, that they take place while Abraham is at Hebron. Then in Genesis chapter 18, Abraham receives three visitors. 
two of whom continue on down to Sodom, the third of whom stays with Abraham, and they have a conversation. Remember who the third one is? That's God himself. And they have a conversation about what God is going to do down there in Lot. That takes place at Hebron. Then in Genesis chapter 20 and verse 1, this will read, go ahead and look in your Bibles. Genesis chapter 20 and verse 1, Abraham leaves Hebron. From there, Abraham journeyed toward the territory of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur, and he sojourned in Gerar. That's the land of the Philistines. So he goes over there. He encounters a fellow whose name was Abimelech over in the land of the Philistines. He leaves Hebron. But then later, later in Genesis chapter 23, Sarah dies. And we find Abraham once again at Hebron, specifically to buy a plot of land that had a cave in it that he is going to use as a burial plot. I will tell you, this is just for free, that you can, well, theoretically, I don't know if you can go to Hebron or not today. Hebron is controlled by the Palestinian Authority, so I'm not real sure you can go to Hebron. Jews are only allowed in the city of Hebron two times a year. Modern Jews. But in Hebron, there is a large building that dates to the time of Herod that is built over tombs. And they are, in all likelihood, the tombs of Abraham and Sarah, as well as the others that are buried there. Okay? Of all the archaeological sites that proclaim themselves to be a tomb, this is actually one that has really good evidence for it. So there's very good indication that this is actually the tomb at Machpelah. It's, very, it's a sacred place to both Jews and Muslims. Sarah's buried there at Hebron in this cave that Abraham buys. All right, so let's continue. I haven't answered the question yet. This is all background. What we then find later in the biblical record is Jacob is at Shechem as well. He's returned from Padan Aram. We remember that, don't we? Joseph, uh, Jacob goes off to get a wife. He gets tricked, and instead of getting a wife, he gets two wives. But he's got to spend 14 years there, and then he spends an extra... Six years there. So he's gone to pay to Aram for 20 years. In the meantime, not only does he have wife number one, wife number two, he has handmaiden number one, handmaiden number two, and a whole bunch of children. The patriarchs. Okay? They come back from pay to Aram. So as he's returning from this place, he lives for a while at Succoth. That's where he pitches his tent first, if you will. But from there, he moves to Shechem. And in Shechem, he actually buys land where his tent is and then builds an altar. That's Genesis chapter 33 and verse 19, which we have already read. What I want you to note about this is that when Jacob builds an altar, he builds it on land that he owns. The text is specific. He buys where his tent is, and on that land he builds an altar, and he sacrifices to God. That's what an altar is about. All right? I think it's interesting, especially when we have Stephen's speech, and it may be the clue to answering this question. So let me give you a theoretical timeline. I'm going to emphasize that word theoretical. Okay? I don't like to deal in theories. You know this if you know me. I like facts. Unfortunately, with this particular question, we don't have, I think, all the facts at readily, hand, readily at hand, except what the information is that we get, and we have to put those together. So a theoretical timeline, if you will, starting with Abraham. Abraham builds an altar at Shechem on land he purchased. Now, wait a minute. Genesis doesn't say he purchased the land. And you are correct. It does not say that he purchased the land. That is, in my mind, hypothetical. It's hypothetical based on what Jacob does later. He buys the land on which he builds an altar. Okay? He doesn't build an altar on someone else's property. He buys it, builds an altar there. Okay? So later on, Jacob repurchases this land... And on that land, he builds an altar. Repurchases, if my theoretical, hypothetical answer to this is correct, he repurchases land that his grandfather, his grandfather being Abraham, had originally bought. How many years before? Well, about 200 years before. 
there is about a 200 year gap between Abraham at Shechem and Jacob at Shechem when he comes back from Paden Aram. Remember, these folks are living very long lives. They're not getting married at 18 years old, and they're not having children right after they get married. So there is a huge age difference or a time gap between the two. So Abraham, again, if my theory is correct, and it is hypothetical, it's not my theory, by the way, this is the theory that other people have. If my idea is correct, Abraham buys a piece of land at Shechem, builds an altar there. Then he moves on to Bethlehem, builds an altar there. Theoretically, he bought some land there as well. Then he moves down to Hebron. He builds another altar. Okay? Theoretically, he bought that piece of property on which the altar was built. Later, he buys a cave there as a burial plot. 200 years later, does Abraham still own the land? Can you imagine that 200 years later, probably people have forgotten that Abraham owns that plot of land. Maybe someone said... Well, we haven't seen Abraham in a while, and we haven't seen his son in a while, and you're his grandson, so if you want this piece of land, you're going to have to do what? You're going to have to buy it. So, theoretically, that's what Jacob does. It's not bought as a burial site. That's not his original intention. He buys it because that's where he's living, and that's where he builds an altar. But later, it's going to be used as a place of entombment as a cemetery, if you will. By inspiration, again, assuming all this is correct, and I understand there's a lot of assumptions here, okay? By inspiration, then, Stephen supplies details that are not contained in the original narrative, all right? He gives us some extra details. Now, I will tell you that if you're sitting out there this evening saying, you haven't convinced me, that's okay, because I'm not entirely sure I'm convinced, all right? That's my caveat to the whole answer to that question. This is a difficult question. What I will say is that if this hypothetical reconstruction is correct, then the cave at Machpelah, Hebron, is not even under consideration. That isn't what Stephen is talking about in Acts chapter 7, verses 15 and 16. Okay, so let me try to sum this up a little bit again. Machpelah is not under consideration. What's being talked about is the field at Shechem. Acts chapter 7 and verse 16 again only concerns that plot at Shechem. The tomb is in existence by the time Joseph and his brothers are buried there. Because we know from the biblical record, Joseph's bones are brought up out of Egypt, buried at Shechem. Stephen seems to indicate that the other patriarchs are brought up and buried at Shechem as well. Okay? That I think we can be fairly clear on, at least in my mind we can all right, so just to kind of wrap this up by conclusion, I think the first problem in Acts chapter 7 and verse 16 is fairly straightforward to solve. Okay, where the bones are by, who the they there refers to. I think that's pretty easy to resolve. Straightforward. Maybe easy is not the word to use. The second problem is more complex and complicated, and the answer may be less than satisfactory. If you come away this evening and say, I'm not really satisfied much with that answer, that's okay. Because I'm freely admitting to you that I'm not 100% satisfied with that answer. But lack of satisfaction does not mean the problem isn't solved. It may be a little far-fetched. Telescoping may be a little far-fetched. Okay? But it's a reasonable solution to the difficulty. So, let me just lay this out there. I'm going to pull that last slide up so you know I'm really at the end. When you deal with problems in the text. And if you delve deeply into the text of the Bible, you're going to encounter some problems. You put the information at hand together. You try to come up with a synthesis. Sometimes you may not be completely satisfied with the the synthesis. You may not be completely convinced. But if it is a reasonable explanation of the problem then there is no contradiction. So we have to look at these problems in this way. And again, we may come away with it saying, well, sounds reasonable. I'm not sure, but it sounds reasonable, in which case we move on. But we do start with this. And and this this is what I have to go back to. Is Stephen inspired or not? 
If the Holy Spirit is inspiring Stephen, then nothing he said in Acts chapter 7 is wrong. To admit otherwise requires us, one, to say Stephen wasn't inspired or God made a mistake. I certainly don't believe God made a mistake, and I don't believe that Stephen isn't inspired. So again, we accept the inspiration, Stephen inspired writer, God doesn't make mistakes. Then we have to put all that together that he's given us and try to figure out how that works with what we know elsewhere in the scriptures. I appreciate your attention this evening as we've gone through this. I understand these were difficult. They will be. This sermon is on YouTube. I'm assuming we're not having any errors back there. It will be on YouTube. Feel free to go back and listen to that again so that you have an opportunity to digest it once more, to see the slides once more. And think about these things and uh, let me know what you think. Okay. And if you come up to me and say, I'm not satisfied, well, I've already told you. I'm not 100% satisfied either. But I'm satisfied enough to come to the conclusion that there isn't an error here in Acts chapter 7. All right. So in just a moment, Austin is going to lead us in a song. If you were here this evening and never obeyed the gospel of Christ, this is going to be an opportunity for you. Everybody's going to stand and sing. When they do that, I'm going to go back to the foyer. If you'd like to talk with me about getting your life right with God, all you got to do is walk back there and let me know that you want to talk. And we'll do that this evening. Do you need to do that tonight? If you do, I'd invite you to join me while we stand and while we sing.